Well, I want to start off by congratulating two more people that finished memorizing all of Romans chapter 12. Yana Didrickson and Phil Langston this week uh, proved they could do it. Well, if you haven't noticed, Christmas is coming. The signs are everywhere. We have made it now through Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Uh, this is the first of Advent, Advent Sunday. And if you still aren't sure, check out Piper's sweater. Did you see that this morning? Okay, it looks like he's this weird elf with his head sticking out. It, uh, that is a sure sign of, well, a sign, a sign of Christmas or mental issues or what, but that sweater is something. And this afternoon, the wise men are going to begin their trek across my yard. Uh, several years ago, it really bugged me that when I'd go into stores, it seemed harder and harder to find anything about Jesus in terms of Christmas. Uh, last night, we were going through a store, an aisle after aisle of Christmas decorations, Christmas stuff, and nothing about Jesus. And so I thought I wanted to do something different with our yard decorations, and I went looking for a big nativity set, which is really hard to find. And I had looked all over, and I thought I exhausted all sources. I actually was praying about this, and I walked into Costco, and of all things, Costco had a sale on giant nativity sets. So I got one. It was great, and um, then I decided to have some fun with it. So it's become my yearly tradition that uh, starting uh, this week, the wise men begin to make the journey from the backyard to the front yard. You know, and uh, the, the star will appear in the east. It's actually just the east side of my yard in the tree, but it will be showing up, and that is a sign that Christmas is coming. Um, as I was preparing this week, we've been going through this series looking at Romans chapter 12, and uh, it struck me the verses we're going to look at this morning, verses 15 and 16, actually have some Christmas buried right in them. And I hope that you will see that with me this morning as we develop this topic. Romans 12, verses 15 and 16 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly, and never be wise in your own sight. You know, my first impression when I looked at this passage, and maybe yours as well, is that what the Apostle Paul is encouraging here is a, a deepening sense of empathy among followers of Jesus. People who say that they are part of his church, who are part of a local body of believers, that, that they would grow to enter more deeply into both the joys and the sorrows of one another's lives. And that is certainly a theme that we see developed in Scripture. Uh, Paul himself often referred to that. If you go back earlier in this chapter, Romans chapter 12, back to verse 10, Paul said we should love one another with brotherly affection and outdo one another in showing honor. Or in his letter to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, this idea of uh, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So, so again, this idea that, that when one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. When one of us suffers, we all suffer. And, uh, and of course, this idea that we should set aside pride. He talks about to let not have a haughty spirit, to associate with the lowly. And uh, those certainly are things that can divide a church. When we begin to draw lines between the, the powerful and the weak, the rich and the poor, the famous and the not famous, uh, the weak versus the strong. Um, and that's important. Failure to address those things does hamper the body of Christ. It does keep it from growing and being what God wants us to be. James, in his letter, addressed this problem with how they were dealing with people that were famous or powerful. Uh, here's what he says in James chapter 2. If a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? James says, I know how it works. You know those little clues that tell you who's important, who's famous, who's got the, the nice car, who's wearing the good jewelry. And uh, when you see that person, you uh, treat them a little different. 
You, you uh, pay them some extra special attention. You, uh, you make sure that they get the good seat. And then you see that person that you can just tell that they're not doing so well. That they, they aren't really up to standard. And, and there are those passive little ways that we sort of relegate them off to the sidelines. And James says, what are you doing? In the body of Christ, these things have no place because we all stand on equal ground at the foot of the cross. One of the things that I love is when I hear people talk about why they chose to come to Dungeness Community Church. And, and they say that it was because when they came in, they felt it was such a, a warm and a friendly and a loving body of people. And so praise God. If, if that is the first impression that we give, then we're doing something right because that is what we should be. We should be people that are open and welcoming to those who come in. But, but I think that I see something else in this verse that maybe is even more significant and certainly harder. What I think I'm seeing is that Paul isn't focusing so much on life within the church as he is on our lives in relation to those outside of our fellowship and in particular those who may be hostile to us. It was Chip Ingram who uh, I've referenced his book a few times. Uh, he wrote a book on Romans chapter 12, and, and he was the one that, as I read, began to get me thinking about this. One of the things about preaching is that you plan a long ways in advance. And so I had planned this Romans 12 series uh, months ago before I ever got into it. Um, I've already done the planning for where we're going to go in 2019, and that's all well and good, but one of the downsides is that sometimes you are deciding how you're going to break up a topic before you've really gotten into it. And by the time you really get into it, you go, yeah, I might have done it a little bit different if I was going to do it over again. And, and this is one of those places where if I were going to do it again, I might have broken this up differently, and it might make it easier for you to see uh, the perspective that Chip Ingram has and what I'm seeing in this passage as well. And I'll give you a few lines of evidence that point me in this direction. The first is there are some bookends around these verses. When Paul talks about rejoicing with those who rejoice, weeping with those who weep, um, not being haughty, associating with lonely, the lowly, you got to look back at verse 14. We looked at this verse last week where he talks about bless those who persecute you. All right, so he talks about this idea of blessing those who oppose us, who persecute us, and then he goes into this uh, section about rejoicing with those who rejoice, weeping with those who weep. And then the next verse, verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. It's, it's the same topic. Do you see that? Blessed those who persecute you, repay no one evil for evil. And right in between is this thing about rejoicing and weeping. Uh, what if between those bookends, what Paul is really doing is he is fleshing out what it means to bless those who persecute us, to bless our enemies. In fact, I see this pattern in Romans 12. If you were to go back and look early on, in verse 4, he talked about the fact that there is one body, the body of Christ, made up of many members, and then he expands that idea. Verses 5 through 8, he talks about having these gifts that differ, let's use them. Okay, remember talking about that? Then you get down to verse 9. He says, let love be genuine. And then verses 10 through 13, he expands on that. Love one another, contribute to the needs of the saints, outdo one another in showing honor. Then you come to verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. And I think he's following the same pattern where he makes this, this big category statement, and then he begins to flesh out, how do you do that? What does it look like? Weep with, rejoice with, repay no one evil for evil. Now, if that is true, then suddenly it makes more sense to me why it might require apostolic instruction to convince us to rejoice and to weep with someone else. Sometimes we may just not feel much connection with people. Uh, th that can happen within a, a family, uh, within the body of Christ, that can certainly happen. Uh, there's a story that has become legendary in our family where uh, a little nephew years ago was watching a movie with his family, and uh, in the movie, the dog died. And, and the, the family was all kind of sniffling and broken up about the fact that, you know, this little boy's dog died in the movie. Except for my little nephew. My little nephew's sitting there cool as a cucumber watching the TV. Not a sniffle, not a blink. 
And his dad finally said, doesn't it make you sad that the boy's dog died after you loved him and everything? And the little guy looks at the TV. Without a blink, he says, it's not my dog. <laughs> that has become the family term whenever we want to say we don't care. It's just, it's not my dog. <laughs> and that certainly can be a problem. But I would maintain that if you're in a small group of close friends, and the, among the early churches, they were not big groups of people. These were small house churches. It's, you don't really need to instruct people to rejoice with their close friends when they're rejoicing or to weep with their close friends when they're weeping. I think those are pretty common responses. I mean, if you're my friend or you say you're my friend and you don't share my happiness, or when I'm really sad, you don't share my sadness, I'd say there's probably something wrong with our friendship. And we're not going to be really close friends for very long if we don't participate any more deeply than that in each other's lives. But what you see all through Romans 12 is that Paul keeps challenging these people to think and to act in ways that are uncommon to the world we live in. He says, don't be conformed to the world. Don't do it the way everybody does it. Be transformed by the renewal of your minds. What's some of the evidence of transformation? Well, we looked at earlier. He said, show hospitality. Reach out to the stranger and open your home. He talks about blessing the persecutor. That seems counterintuitive. And to bless our persecutor, yet we find that it frees our spirit. And now he says, rejoice and weep with those who oppose us. And that requires opening our heart in some very difficult ways. It means we have to step through the barrier of emotional detachment that, that might want to say, it's not my dog. It means that we have to overcome jealousy and resentment. We have to reject hostility even the passive-aggressive stuff and, and any sense of delight we might find in seeing an opponent suffer. It means that I'm willing to connect compassionately with people and people who may live and act in ways that I find offensive. At times, the, the manner in which we express joy or compassion may be simple and obvious. But at other times, I think it requires some very careful and prayerful thought to know how we can embrace, encourage, and empathize when we can't endorse the choices a person has made. So let's think a bit about what that may look like. Rejoice with those who rejoice. You know, Jesus made for an awesome party guest. The very first miracle we ever find Jesus doing is he's invited to a wedding and the wedding runs out of wine. And what does Jesus do? He makes more wine. He helps the party keep going. He didn't preach a sermon. In fact, it would appear that nobody at the wedding except the servants who saw what happened even knew what he had done. The only thing the guests knew was that the party kept on being a party and that the wine got better as it went. We find in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus goes to another get-together, a get-together that some people would have said he shouldn't be at. So as Jesus passed on from where, where he'd been at, and he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Now here's the problem, Matthew at the tax booth, that means Matthew is a tax collector. And among the Jews, the tax collectors were hated because they serve the Romans to take money from their people. So Jesus already is stepping outside of the acceptable boundaries to even talk to this guy, let alone say, hey, let's go to your house. But that's where we find Jesus. Jesus reclined at table in the house, and behold, many tax collectors, all of Matthew's friends, and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why did your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? This is not what respectable rabbis do. This doesn't fit the mold of what the religious uh, elite should be doing. Why is he doing this? And Jesus overhears it. 
And he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Last week, we looked at Paul's counsel to bless those who persecute us, and and I noted that it was the same advice that Jesus gave. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And we talked about what does it mean to bless my enemy? And I suggested to you that there are two things that we do when we bless an enemy. We pray for their good and we act for their good. So let me ask you a question. If you are praying for someone's good and you are acting for their good, what is going to happen to them? This is not a trick question, folks. Good things. What are you supposed to do when good things happen to the people that you don't like? I know what my response is. Shoot. I know I prayed that. I didn't really mean that. You pray for their good. You act for their good. And good things happen to them. And Paul would say, rejoice. Be happy for them. Be happy with them. Not flowery, schmaltzy, butter up, but but sincere congratulations. Oh, now that's not hard unless we give in to our little egos. You probably know the story reported in Pravda, the, the Soviet newspaper years ago, that there was a race between an American horse and a Soviet horse, and in the race, the Soviet horse lost. And the way Pravda reported it was that the Soviet horse came in second, and the American horse came in next to last. (laughs) We have a hard time sincerely congratulating those that we don't like when good things happen to them. You have that ordinary neighbor that just makes life difficult. And one day you walk out and you see sitting in his driveway a brand new boat, the boat you have always dreamed of having. What do you do? Can you walk over there and sincerely say, congratulations, that is a beautiful boat? What about that colleague at work who's made it tough for you, has competed with you, promotion's coming up, promotion that you're positive you're going to get, and they get it instead? Can you rejoice with those who rejoice? Now, those things are hard, but they're not tricky. Where it gets tricky is when you get into uh, some issues like, oh, let's say, politics. (laughs) And there's that guy that is just so annoying. He's got bumper stickers all over his car, and every one of them stands for something that you can't stand. And then you get to election time, and his candidate wins. How do you deal with that? Or maybe it's some of those big moral issues. We live in an age where many people engage in and celebrate life choices, which, as followers of Jesus, we believe fall outside of God's will. What do we do then? If we love people that aren't followers of Jesus, which is exactly what we're called to do, then I'll let you know a little secret. You can expect them to do things that aren't the way Jesus would do them. This should not be a surprise. But how do we rejoice with them? How do we weep with them? How do we have an emotional connection? Because if we're going to withhold an emotional connection from everyone until they get it right, we're going to be withholding forever. I'm not suggesting that we should applaud destructive or immoral actions, but before we deliver a self-righteous lecture, we need to give careful thought and prayerfully ask God to show us how do we love this person without compromising our convictions. And I think that takes us back to verse 2 in Romans 12. Paul said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, 
what is good and acceptable and perfect? I wish I could give you a simple answer to these thorny questions. You're probably thinking of some situations right now. Well, Tim, what about, and I don't know. I don't know the answer. It's interesting that Paul says, as our mind is renewed, one of the things we do is we test, we seek to discern, we look for, in particular situations, how should I respond, how should I act here that is, that is good in God's sight, that is acceptable, that is perfect. And I just would challenge you that rather than erecting the wall, pushing away, saying, it's not my dog, that when God gives you the opportunities, you prayerfully do the hard work to say, Lord, what does it mean in this situation with this person? Not to feel I have to agree with what they're doing, but how do I demonstrate love? Where can I, how can I rightly rejoice? Where can I, how can I show compassion? Weeping with those who weep. Jesus' example in this, it's the shortest verse in the Bible, comes from John chapter 11, verse 35. It says, Jesus wept. The occasion was, Jesus' close friend Lazarus had died. And Jesus, there at the graveside, surrounded by mourners. The interesting thing is, Jesus is about to do a miracle that nobody sees coming. He is about to raise Lazarus from the dead. And yet, even knowing that that's about to happen, Jesus pauses for a moment amidst the grief, and he grieves too. He weeps. Here's the response. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. One of the ways people know that we love them is when they know that we're willing to grieve with them. I'm not a master at this, but there have been times when I think God has allowed me to catch a glimpse of what this love looks like. Many years ago, I worked in a professional setting with, uh, well, the office, there were about probably 12 to 15 of us in this office, and it became pretty apparent that two of the people in the office were having an affair. Both of them were married but they really were making no secret about the fact that they were going to lunch together on a regular basis, sharing their own little secrets, uh, looking adoringly at one another. It, it was pretty obvious what was going on. And they knew who I was. They, they knew I was a believer. They knew it wasn't something that I could or would endorse. But that's what was going on. Well, on weekend, there was a terrible accident, and the woman of this pair, and her husband were both killed. That was also the weekend that the man involved in that relationship, that his wife found out about the affair because she couldn't understand why he was so grief-stricken over what had happened. And when she knew what had happened, she put him out of the house. So in, in one weekend, he lost his lover, and his family. I knew this was happening. I knew I was going to see him on Monday. I'm saying, God, what do I do? What do I do? I mean, this is a messy situation. I don't agree with what this guy's been doing. At one level, I could step back and say, you know what? He kind of got what's coming to him. That, that would be easy to do. Sin has consequences. I thought, no, th this, is a, this is another human being who has just experienced tremendous loss. So he walked in the office that Monday morning. He is a big guy. He is about 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, and I walked up to him, and I just said, I am so sorry. And I put my arms out. This guy grabs me in a hug, and he picks me up. My toes are barely touching the floor. I am dangling from this guy. And he just hangs on and weeps. Now, now listen, I was sorry. That was true. I was sorry that he'd been in an affair. I was sorry that woman died. I was sorry his family was coming apart. I was truly sorry for all that was happening in his life. 
He knew that what he was doing wasn't right. He didn't need me to inform him of that. But he did need me to weep with him. The result of that was, that guy had never spent a lot of time with me, but, but we started spending some time together. And we started talking about some of the bigger issues of life as he tried to process through this situation. But, but what got it started, what opened that door, was simply weeping with someone who was weeping. As a chaplain, I'm often called to scenes where people have experienced great loss. I remember several years ago going to one scene, a, a man had taken his life, and when I showed up, uh, one of the deputies on scene said, uh, hey, just so you know, before you go in there, um, the wife is an atheist. Well, that's okay. Chaplains don't, you know, discriminate. And uh, so I went in, and, and it, was, it was a tough, tough afternoon. But as I spent time with her, as we talked, as we processed, over the next week or so, she began to open up, and uh, she finally let me know that she wasn't really a good atheist. <laughs> we got to pray together. Weep with those who weep. Maybe you haven't done a lot of it. Maybe comforting those who are grieving is even intimidating to you. What do you do? It just seems overwhelming. So let me just give you a little practical advice on how you can weep with those who weep. First thing I would say is, uh, you just need simple words. Sometimes we're so afraid because we don't know what to say. You don't need to say much. It's enough to say, I am so sorry for your loss. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't ask tons of questions, okay? It's not an interrogation, but, but ask the person, what happened? Let them tell the story. They may need to tell the story two or three times over. People going through grief and shock will tend to repeat the story. That's okay. That's part of the process. Don't be quick to try and fix anything. You'll note that Paul doesn't say we should fix those who weep. He just says weep with them. In fact, something that I was taught years ago by a more senior chaplain was don't be too quick to hand people the Kleenex. You know why? When someone's crying and you hand them a handkerchief, you hand them a Kleenex, you know what you just said to them? Time to stop crying. People need to cry. Let them cry. Don't be afraid of the tears. There's a time for the Kleenex, but it's okay to let people work through the grief. Don't tell them it'll be better soon. It won't. Don't tell them you understand. You probably don't. Don't tell them your story. It's not the time. It's the time for their story. And then I'd say, don't be afraid of silence. I think one of the things I've learned as a chaplain is that I spend a lot more time saying nothing than I do talking to people. They just need someone to be there with them. When you read the book of Job, and Job goes through all of his loss and trial, and his friends show up, you discover that his friends really were at their best when they just sat there and said nothing. They were just present. If you're going to ask questions, ask open-ended questions, things that let people talk, not just yes-no answers. And, and if you don't know what to say, just reflect back what they've told you. If they tell you how much they miss their mom, just say, you really miss your mom a lot. That, that's all they need, is just to let them begin to process the feelings and the emotions they're going through. The other thing you can do is simple acts. We oftentimes say, hey, if you need anything, give me a call. Well, trust me, the person in deep grief has no idea what they need. They, they, I've seen people that couldn't tell you the phone number of their best friend be, because our minds just become a jumble. Uh, so here's some simple things you can do. Bring them a meal that can go in the refrigerator. Bring them a couple meals that can go in the freezer. Uh, take the garbage out to the curb or bring the empty can back in. Get the mail out of the mailbox. Bring it up to the house. Get some flowers. Give them a card. And then remember that grief is a process. We all tend to really grieve for the person right up through the memorial service. And then we kind of move on and forget. But the person in grief hasn't forgotten. The process has just begun for them. Oftentimes, the lowest point of grieving takes up to a year before a person comes to that point. And even once they've reached that point, it can be anywhere from six months to three years after that before they really find the new normal. 
So what means so much is if you think to write them a, a kind note a few weeks later, or if you remember an important anniversary, or if you remember the anniversary of the loss, don't be afraid that if you bring it up, you send them a card or something, you're going to remind them of something they were trying to forget. Trust me, they haven't forgotten. Okay? They know about it. They're thinking about it. The fact that you think about it, you thought about them, that means a lot. And if you see that there's a grief share group starting at the church, maybe let them know. Those come around on a regular basis. It's a great place for them to, to meet with some other people and work through the process. These are practical ways that we can weep with those who weep. Then Paul says that we should live in harmony with one another. My wife comes from a very musical family. There are five girls that all sing together. They all sing parts. It's beautiful. But one of the things that you find out about harmony is it's really important that people blend. It's bad if you have five people that all want to be soloists singing together, all vying for who's going to be the center of attention. And Paul says live in harmony with each other. This isn't about who can outshine the other one. And certainly this has application within the body of Christ, but I think it also says something about how we interact with those who are not yet followers of Jesus, and in particular, those who oppose us. Jesus said uh, to Thomas, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I believe that. I believe that in following Jesus, I am following the truth. That he is the way, but there is a danger in having truth and being a person of the way. Because then it becomes easy to see ourselves as superior to other people. A little spiritual pride creeps in, some self-righteousness, and there are a few things that are less attractive to a spiritual seeker than being lectured to by a self-righteous, pompous, true believer. Paul says, um, don't be haughty. Live in harmony. It says, be willing to associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. See, finding the truth and thinking you're the source of truth are two very different things. People who become enamored with their own wisdom tend to become blind to their own foolishness. And, but they're the only ones who don't see it. Don't become haughty in your own eyes. All right, so you're all wondering. I said at the outset I saw a little bit of Christmas in these verses. Well, the wise men this week are going to start their trek across my yard. The question is, what were they coming to see? Why? Why were they on that trip? Why do we celebrate Christmas? Well, it's a big theological word. The theological word is incarnation. What it speaks of is that God came into our world in human flesh, to walk among us. Not only to show us, to model for us who God is and how he loves us, but but to actually die for us. That he rose again. Incarnation. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. I want to play a little clip something that uh, many of you probably have heard before. Paul Harvey, the legendary radio announcer, back in 1965, first recorded a reading called The Birds. The man I'm talking about was not a Scrooge now. He was a kind, a decent, a mostly good man, generous to his family and upright in his dealings with other men, but he just did not believe in all of that incarnation stuff which the churches proclaim at Christmas time. It just did not make sense. And he was too honest to pretend otherwise. He could not swallow the Jesus story about God coming to earth as a man. He told his wife, I'm truly sorry to distress you, but I'm just not going with you to church this Christmas Eve. He said he'd feel like a hypocrite, that he'd much rather just stay home, but that he would wait up for them. So he stayed and they went to the midnight service. Now, shortly after the family drove away in the car, snow began to fall. He went to the window to watch the flurries getting heavier and heavier. Then he went back to his fireside chair, began to read his newspaper. Minutes later, he was startled by a thudding sound, and then another, then yet another. At first, he thought somebody must be throwing snowballs against the living room window. 
But when he went to the front door to investigate, he found a flock of birds huddled out there miserably in the snow. They had been caught in the storm in a desperate search for shelter. They had tried to fly through his large landscape window. That was what had been making the sound. Well, he couldn't let those poor creatures just lie there and freeze. So he remembered the barn where his children stabled their pony. That would provide a warm shelter. All he would have to do is direct the birds into that shelter. Quickly, he put on a coat and galoshes, and he tramped through the deepening snow to the barn, and he opened the doors wide. And inside the barn, he turned on a light so the birds would know the way in. But the birds did not come in. So he figured that food would entice them. He went back into the house and fetched some breadcrumbs and sprinkled those on the snow, making a trail of breadcrumbs to the yellow-lighted, wide-open doorway of the stable. But to his dismay, the birds ignored the breadcrumbs. The birds just continued to flop around helplessly in the snow. He tried catching them. He could not. He tried shooing them into the barn by walking around them, waving his arms, but instead they scattered in every direction, every direction except into the warm, lighted barn. And that's when he realized that they were afraid of him. They were afraid of him. To him, he reasoned, I'm a strange, terrifying creature. If only I could think of some way to let them know that they can trust me, that I'm not trying to hurt them, but to help them. But how? Any move he made tended to frighten them and confuse them. They just would not follow. They would not be led or shooed because they feared him. And he thought to himself, if only I could be a bird now, if I could be a bird and mingle with them and speak their language and tell them not to be afraid, then I could show them the way to the safe warm barn, but I would have to be one of them, wouldn't I? So they could see and hear and understand. At that moment, the church bells began to ring. The sound reached his ears above the sounds of the wind. And he stood there listening to the bells at Deste Fidelis, listening to the bells pealing the glad tidings of Christmas. And he sank to his knees in the snow. Paul Harvey, I hope for you and those you love, this will be a wonderfully Merry Christmas. God's Spirit lives in us. We're the package that he wants to incarnate his love to the world. When we come alongside those who are hostile, we enter into that Christmas miracle of incarnation. We, we bring love in practical and tangible ways to both those who love us as well as those who oppose us. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We weep with those who weep. We engage with those that we're tempted to think are beneath us. May we be people of the way, learning to live God's love and truth with others, friend or foe, with compassion and humility. Amen? <laughs>